Oh, there was a woman in the Bible days. She had been sick, sick so very long. Well, she heard my Jesus was passing by. So she joined the gathering throng. And while she was pushing her way through, someone asked her, what are you trying to do? She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. She stood there crying, oh, and whoa, and oh, 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 Lord, oh, Lord. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. She spent her money, there we go, here and there, until she had no had no more to spare. The doctors done all they could, but their medicine would do no good. When she touched him, the Savior didn't see, but still he turned around and cried, somebody touched me. She said, it was I who just want to touch the hem of your garment. I know I'll be made whole. She stood there crying, oh, and whoa, and oh, 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 Lord, and oh, Lord. She said, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, I know I'll be made whole. sanctuary over I want to thank you that you don't have a clock up in here <laughs> and, and if you would if you would go ahead and call Clinton first and tell them to take that clock down <laughs> I've uh, when Nancy told me what the uh, recipient of your Wells Fest this year would be uh, I thought wow growing up knowing it fits very much with what is on my heart, uh, I think, today. The problem that I immediately have is that I have two sermons. <laughs> now, this one, this one's 25 minutes long. <laughs> and this one is 24 minutes and 60 seconds long. <laughs> so, uh, the best I know to do is do what I know best. You know, from the study we had back uh, in the late spring uh, on loving God uh, with your heart, your mind, and your soul, uh, at the time that I did that study, uh, I was, I think I had shared with you that when young preachers called asking me if they wanted me to preach, that I'd say, I've got one sermon, you decide when you want me to preach it. And, uh, about two weeks after I finished with y'all, I don't know, I think you, something was, I don't know, you don't ask me back here again to, to speak, okay? Because, <laughs> because two weeks after that, uh, the bishop puts his arm around me and says, uh, I need you to go to Clinton for a year to do an interim. <laughs> and I, I said to myself, I dare not say it to the bishop, you mean I got to write 50 sermons? Because I've already got one. Uh, well, enough of that. <clears throat> you, 
You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Why is it you reckon that we in the church preach so few sermons on loving yourself? That has been heavy in my heart for many years until I got a grip on uh, this business of loving yourself. There's so many things in life that can shape your sense of being. I once had a mother to call me uh, that her daughter had come home from school and that her daughter was in tears. And she asked, can I bring Susie up to see you? I said, sure, bring her on, that's all right. And I watched a little girl cry for about five minutes, and then I said to little Susie, what, why, why are you crying? What, what happened? And she said, the girls at school today laughed at the shirt I was wearing. I looked at her mother. I didn't understand what, why would they laugh at her shirt. And her mother said, because the shirt buttoned on the wrong side, and they knew it was a boy's shirt. I had a call, it came from a distraught mother. I didn't know her, she didn't know me. I was the associate pastor at the church and part of my responsibility was campus ministry. She called me to say, I need you to see if you can find my daughter. I said, what, what's happened? And she said, well, she called us about an hour ago and she told me that she had failed me. that she had not been selected to be in the sorority that mother had been in and aunt had been in and grandmother had been in and she had failed. We were able to find that young lady on the Ole Miss campus and get her to a counselor who was able to walk her through that semester of being unlovable. He came into my study one day. I mean, where's Jane? 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 Oh, Jane Lee? Yeah. Oh, she did? She said I can already worship. Tell her that I called her name in worship. <laughs> What I was going to say is that the secretary's desk was between the door and my office. And he walked in, walked right past her, came into my study, grabbed the back of the chair, said nothing. But I could tell that he had been crying. Of all the people that I would have ever expected to cry, it wasn't that 74-year-old man. He held everybody in church with contempt, even me. Tell you the truth, I got to the point where I dodged him. You know, I don't know if other preachers do it, but you know when you're out shopping somewhere in a, in, in a clothing store and you see a church member, you say, oh, dang, this is, my day. <laughs> this is my day off, and you just, you know. Uh, I can tell you. I watch little kids do it, and I know how to get into the middle of one of those clothes racks that go around. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Mercy, I, I got work to do. I ain't got time for this. He's a preacher. Can you imagine how it must feel to have your mother say to you every day of your remembering life, remembering life, I despise the day you were born. 
And in that moment, I understood why he was so contemptible. He went on to say to me, you know, how in the world can you love yourself if you're despicable? You see, I don't understand why the church, why we pastors haven't preached more on loving yourself. Maybe it is that we thought that people would think that we were wanting them to be narcissistic. Now, I don't know what narcissism is, but I know how to pronounce it. (laughs) I'll leave the rest of that up to Jeff Parker. (laughs) Where was I, John? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think narcissism must be the opposite of hating your own being. I think it would come close to that. Over the years, I look back and I think about my own growing up, and what I'm about to tell you is not to bash my father. I think probably my father, back in 1940, whenever he came home from World War II, I think he had that post-traumatic syndrome. He never talked about the war. He was into himself. Every once in a while he would laugh, but he never moved a muscle. He was a driver's license examiner, and uh, all my friends, when it came time for them to go take their tests, uh, they come back and they ask me, what does it mean when your father laughs? And I said, well, what do you mean, what does it mean when my father laughs? He said, your father never moves a muscle when he laughs. <laughs> you know. And uh, it was just, he's a good man. I understand that now. But when I was growing up, In my growing up years, one of the most lingering memories is my father telling me to get something for him and for me to bring the wrong thing and for him to look at me and say, you're not worth a damn. When I uh, felt a call to preach as a young lad, it just it was just an idea. But in my uh, youth years, when I began to think about what it meant that Jesus had died for me, that God loved me that much that he gave his only son to love me. The only problem was that I lived in the South. And in the South, there is a strong appetite for a judging God. I was taught, or I had to deal with the fact that here I was trying to be a Christian, and yet being told, on the other hand, God watches you every day. God hears you in everything you say. God knows everywhere you go. God knows. Now, you couple that with a sense of in your being, you're not worth a damn. And I can tell you, fella, you can talk all day long about being Christian and loving yourself. I struggled with that for years. How do you love yourself? when the deck is stacked against you like that. I don't know when it happened, partly during my life. I think it may have been when uh, after 18 years of marriage, 
uh, I had a wife to say, I'm out of here. I had never failed at something as simple as a marital relationship. I did realize that we both had our own demons. I packed mine and took them to church every Sunday. If you want to know the winsome nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just be aware that we who preach that word are not trying to tell you we're there already. We're trying to tell you, come on, let's go together. You see. I got that divorce, she got that divorce, and uh, you know, they say misery loves company. Well, I can tell you, not always. If you've been in a divorce, you know that there are days and weeks and years that that kind of misery wants no company. Well, you know, over the years, that, that just turned me. I happened to have a church. I went to them, and I said to them, I don't need you to take my side, and I don't need you to take her side, but we both sure could use love and grace, and that's what they gave us. That's the day I realized what the church was, that place of grace. I asked a good friend once, Reagan, why God didn't let me meet Nancy Ellen Osmond the first go round? <laughs> and he said to me, because he wanted you to be blessed with two beautiful daughters. And because you are not ready for a person like Nancy Allen Osmond, my, my, my. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how freed up you are when you experience tough situations that make you the most vulnerable and make you the most open to God and what God can show you? I don't know about you, but for me, the most vulnerable times in life have been when I most willing, I was the most willing to turn to God. And I was most willing to try and listen to his Holy Spirit. In this instance, God spoke to my soul and he asked, do you remember, you, do you remember when you were baptized, John? And I said, yes, I was, I was not a baby. I was 11 years old when I was baptized. And, uh, I was one of two in the membership training class, that's what they call confirmation back then, in the training class of 10 who had not been baptized as an infant. And speaking in my spirit, I told God I had believed in God's love for me in the life and death of Jesus. This is what I heard God say to me. Your believing didn't make it so. You're accepting that love for you from me, your God, your Father, your creator of your soul. I'm offering you, John, accept my love for you. And <laughs> It doesn't have to be anybody else. It can just be you. It, right now, in this moment, it is you. And what I determined then was that God loving me makes it worth my loving me. You see, it can't be otherwise. I think there are probably stories that abound in church after church of what has happened because 
we the church fail to teach it is okay to love yourself. And when you go to loving yourself, it doesn't mean you're selfish. It means that if you can love yourself with the agape love of God, then this business of loving the neighbor, it's, it's nothing to it. Because when you know who you are in your being, you are able to do for others caring for their being. My love of me has helped me help others to know God loves them. I had one lady who came to me and she said, you know, I've been, I've been in this journey for 60 plus years of trying to be a Christian and this morning you told me it was okay for me to love me. And she started crying, saying to me, I like loving me. You see, it's okay. I mean, that's what Jesus being on that cross is. It is not to then turn around and beat us over the head when we somehow don't fit the shoulds and must and autos in life. You know? Can I say something that's just close to being risque? <laughs> the lady who gave me a tattoo on my cheek yesterday said, go ahead. I learned many years ago uh, the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not should on thyself. Thou shalt not should own yourself. You see, life for us in the church can so easily become, I'm going because I ought to. I know I should be there. I'm going because I, I know I should be there. And yeah, when you go home, you say, well, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. But the fact of the matter is that that's what, not what God wants. He doesn't want us to feel that we got to. God's spirit of love in us gives us the wanna. You see. I've missed wells. I have missed what I, uh, first couple of Sundays I came here, Nancy made me come. Uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> and I tell you, some of your worship practices just drove me up the wall. <laughs> I'm a traditionalist. And let me tell you what I hear a good deal of when I come here. I hear people picking up each other in healing moments so that you go back out in that world better off than you were when you got here. How in the world God did that with you, I don't know. <laughs> but he did. I mean, yes, Keith was your leader, but I'm talking about today, from this moment forward, who are you going to be as well and don't let it be just who you have been. You started yesterday with a I mean, mark. Uh, woo! Man, that was good stuff. And so it's a beginning place for you. And I think it works best that you offer your best self when you are in love with you. Because God made you lovable. I say now, I had a closing. I think it's over in this other sermon. <laughs> what time is it, Nancy? <laughs> huh? Twelve o'clock? You know, I meant to tell you at the beginning of this. Uh, 
This is how I go about how, when it's time to stop. If, if two people, uh, if two people cough, I think to myself, I got 15 minutes. <laughs> when it gets up to eight people coughing, uh, it's time for me to call the Lord into this place <laughs> and send us on our way. So do me a favor, will you? Will everybody call? <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. Call. <laughs> Y'all just wear me out. <laughs> so the, the, the rules of the game are changed now. God, God changed the rules that day at Golgotha. The Jewish means of righteousness was to prove oneself righteous. You and I at Golgotha were made righteous. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.